Hello and welcome to the session that involves the most important topic in orthopedics for FMG examination this year. And uh, basically what we have tried to do is that uh, <coughs> converted we, we, means we are discussing all the questions which have been asked in the last three to four years. And within those questions, we are going to have an overview of the topic in general. All right. So the first question is basically a question that has been asked from the tuberculosis of the hip joint. Now, it was a very basic, very simple question like what is the first site to be affected more commonly by tuberculosis of the hip joint? And some of the structures were marked like the first structure that was, uh, as you know, that the hip joint is made up of the acetabulum the head of the femur and the synovium in between. So these are the three surfaces that are first site, potential first site to be affected by the tuberculosis of the hip joint. And the first most common site to be affected by the tuberculosis of the hip joint is the acetabulum always, right? So acetabulum is the first most common site to be affected by tuberculosis of the hip joint. So that was the answer for that particular question. So uh, as you know that some of the structures were given uh, numerical representations and in the options there were some of the numbers which were asked and 4 is the answer for this question because 4 is representing the acetabulum and acetabulum is the first most common site to be affected by tuberculosis of the hip joint. Now apart from this, you know, uh, if you are reading this topic that is tuberculosis of the hip joint, there are two essential things which are important for you to remember and that is the first one is the stages of the tuberculosis of the hip. You know, as the disease progresses, as the disease advances, then it is getting converted into a stage of progression. Like the first stage is the stage of synovitis where there will be a collection of the fluid inside the hip joint as a result of which the accumulation of more fluid inside a, um, a limited carrying capacity of the hip joint will cause pain and in order to limit that pain involuntarily the limb will move or the hip will acquire the attitude of flexion abduction and external rotation so the attitude in this stage is that of flexion abduction external rotation and you know, whenever there is an abduction deformity, the pelvis tilts down and then the patient would be having apparent lengthening. That means it is not a true lengthening, which is almost impossible. The patient would be having an apparent lengthening. So this stage is also known by the stage of apparent lengthening. Now, this is the first stage. That is a stage of synovitis. How the patient will be presenting on examination, the limb would be kept in flexion, abduction and external rotation. And the stage is also known by the name of stage of apparent lengthening. All right. Now, as the disease progresses to involve the joint surfaces, that will be called by the stage of early arthritis. It is early arthritis, right? And once there is early arthritic stage where the nerve endings of the head of the femur will be exposed to the acetabulum margins, while the nerve endings of the acetabulum will be exposed to the head of the femur margins. And if there is a frictional movement in between the two, the condition would be painful for the patient. So in order to limit the pain, all the movements of the hip joints are blocked. And because the flexors are stronger, because the adductors are stronger, because the internal rotators are stronger, so the limb will acquire the position, limb will acquire the attitude of flexion, adduction and internal rotation. So you know, this time the examiners are asking about these attitudes also. And the reason for that, because it is slightly confusing, because in a single disease, the same disease, the patient could be presenting with variable attitudes. The patient could be presenting with variable clinical features. Like in a stage of synovitis, there was flexion, abduction, external rotation of the thigh. While in case of the stage of early arthritis, there is flexion, adduction, internal rotation of the thigh. And this time, because the patient is having an adduction attitude, the pelvis on the affected side would be tilted up <coughs> as a result of which the patient would be having an apparent shortening of the affected limb, right? When this stage will progress to an advanced one, that is advanced arthritis, then in that case, the attitude will become more severe. That means flexion will remain flexion, but it will be more severe in uh, degrees. Adduction will remain adduction, but there will be more severe adduction. The internal rotation will remain the same, but there will be more severe internal rotation. So flexion, adduction, internal rotation, but this time, because some amount of the head of the femur might have been eaten away by the organism, as a result of which there will be a true shortening observed in this stage. That is a stage of true shortening. That is a stage of advanced arthritis. And finally, when the head of the femur becomes too small to be contained successfully inside the acetabulum, it will easily dislocate. And this results in the stage of dislocation. So the fourth one or the terminal stage of 
tuberculosis of the hip joint is the stage of dislocation all right so at least these are the two points the first point that you came to know about this condition is that what is the first most common site to be affected and the second one is the stage because nowadays they are asking that in a stage of true shortening what is the attitude or if the patient is presenting with this kind of the uh, uh, true shortening what is the stage if the patient is presenting with the stage of early arthritis then what is the attitude what is the uh, uh, limb length discrepancy so these are the kind of the questions they are asking today all right now apart from this the third feature that also you have to remember are the x-ray findings and you know it is extremely extremely important for you to remember that reduction in the joint space is something which you cannot escape which you cannot <coughs> rule out because once there is a reduction of the joint space mentioned in the question then possibly they are asking about the tuberculosis of that particular joint all right so the reduction in the joint space as a result of which now one more thing because this entire site is affected by the organism so the density of the bone would be reduced so there will be periarticular osteopenia periarticular osteopenia and as far as the named x-ray findings are concerned like pestle in mortar appearance what happens in pestle in mortar appearance all of you are aware of about the oakley that pestle in mortar right <coughs> in hindi it is known as oakley now what happens over here that the head of the fever becomes too small it seems to be contained inside the large acetabulum that is uh, giving it a appearance of a uh, mortar and the pestle is head of the femur so pestle in mortar appearance and finally the named x-ray finding is wandering acetabulum that means acetabulum is no more congruent or the articular margins of the acetabulum are no more congruent with that of the head of the femur so it is uh there is a sense of incongruency in between the two so the acetabulum is wandering for the head of the femur so these are the four x-ray named x-ray findings reduction in the joint space is the most important one periarticular osteopenia pestle in mortar appearance as well as wandering acetabulum you know night cry is something that you have to remember night cry means the condition which is more symptomatic particularly during the rest period during the night night cries are usually the features of tuberculosis of the hip joint although there are certain other conditions which are more painful at night but this term night cry was coined for tuberculosis of the hip joint right now this is one thing that you have to remember about this particular condition <coughs> so wandering acetabulum is something that you have to remember <coughs> now next is tuberculosis of the spine now every time you see the x-ray of the vertebral column in the lateral view and in that lateral visualization of the vertebral column if there is a reduction of the joint space in between the two vertebrae that means reduction of the joint space in between the two vertebrae with some destruction of the vertebral bodies then you are looking at the x-ray of the tuberculosis of the spine also known by the name of Potts spine all right so identification of the x-ray that is point number one how will you identify reduction in the joint space as well as periarticular destruction of the joint space that is a periarticular uh, destruction of the vertebral body all right at a single at a singular level so that is point pot's spine identification now point number two related to this point pot's spine or tuberculosis of the spine is that <coughs> Uh, the most common type of this tuberculosis of the spine is the paradiscal, paradiscal type, right? Paradiscal means involvement of the vertebral body and the intervertebral disc. So all of you know that there is an intervertebral disc in between the vertebral body uh, uh, and if there is an involvement of the intervertebral disc along with the adjacent vertebral body, so this is the paradiscal involvement and it is the most common type, all right? And point number three, that majority of the times as far as management of this condition is concerned majority of the times you have to put the patient on ATT you have to put the patient on rest you have to observe the patient for any neurological deficit so majority of the time this will be your answer for the tuberculosis of the spine until and unless they are providing you the condition which is known by the name of <coughs> bowel or bladder incontinence like if there is a bowel or bladder incontinence right then in that case the treatment is going to be a surgical decompression all right surgical decompression would be the management in that case other than this um, what you have to 
remember majority of the time the answer the, that the examiner would be seeking from you is to start the antituberculosis regimen ask the patient to go for complete bed rest and observe for neurological deficit so these are the three findings these are the three aspects that you have to remember for this particular condition that is tuberculosis of the spine all right now there is a trend that these examiners are following that for the last uh, three to four years they are asking one brace all right now as you can very clearly see that this is the kind of the brace which is used in case of a newborn in order to prevent something from going beyond the extent of a normalcy all right so following brace is indicated in as far as identification of this brace is concerned whenever the thighs are kept in abduction whenever the thighs are fixed in abduction how you are going to identify this brace identification of this brace requires two point point number one that it is a newborn all right the brace is that the patient uh, is a newborn who is wearing this brace and point number two that the thighs are held in kept in abduction all right that the thighs are held in abduction so these are the two identifying criteria for a brace in case of ddh that is developmental dysplasia of hip all right now we are going to talk about the important braces this is for the developmental dysplasia of hip so how will you identify a brace for ddh that is the thighs are going to be held in abduction in case of a newborn and what is the name of this brace the name of this brace is palic harness all right this is something by which we have already talked about and we are going to talk about this in the session now that uh, important braces in orthopedics which you should be knowing about like if you look at this brace where there is there is a immobilization of the thoraco lumbo and the sacral column so this is known as boston brace right boston brace which is also known as tls brace while the other kind of a brace is where there is a immobilization of the cervical column there is a immobilization of the thoracic lumbar as well as sacral column so entire vertebrae is immobilized in milwaukee brace all right so this is milwaukee brace and milwaukee brace is also known as ctls brace that means cervical thoraco lumbo sacral brace and both these two braces are indicated in scoliosis both these two braces are indicated in scoliosis simple like you we have already talked about that what are the reasons what are the differences where to use the scolio uh, this milwaukee brace where to use this boston brace and what are the differences in the indications but here we are just to identify the brace and the indication the purpose for which this brace is uh that the patient is asked to wear this brace all right so following as you can very clearly observe in this one this is the boston brace you can identify the milwaukee brace you can identify now here when you see both there there is a pair of shoe which is connected by a bar it is a brace for or it is a splint for ctev all right so indication is always ctev that is congenital telepis equino varus but you know majority of the time what you are going to be provided with is the dennis brown splint they have already asked this question multiple times dennis brown splint and dennis brown splint both there are two shoes a pair of shoe which is connected by a bar in between but there is another one which they can ask in future because nowadays this dennis brown splint is slightly getting replaced by a sfab brace all right so this is sfab that is steen beek foot abduction brace foot abduction brace all right steen beek foot abduction brace now how will you identify that this is not a db splint as you can very clearly see that the feet are more abducted they are almost abducted to 90 degree and instead of a bar instead of a bar we are having a rod interconnecting rod so there is a abduction which is almost extensive uh, extending all the way up to 90 degree and there is a rod which is connecting the two shoes all right so this is a steen beek foot abduction brace both of them are indicated in ctv once the over correction is achieved in order to prevent the recurrence of the condition all right whatever the deformity is you have corrected it has to be placed inside these db splints in order to prevent the recurrence all right what is the age for which this splint is used 
so the age till which this splint is used is up to one year of age or you can say till the age of walking when the child starts walking the CTEV splint that means Dennis Brown splint or SFAB is replaced by a CTEV shoe so hopefully everything is clear related to this particular topic like identification of the brace or the splint now there is another splint which is responsible for keeping the ankle in a neutral position right if the ankle is dropped down like this so the patient would be finding it difficult to walk with a normal gait in order to prevent this deformity from getting permanent that means in order to get uh, prevent equinus from getting permanent the patient is made to wear this ankle foot orthosis so if there is any brace any splint which is responsible for keeping the ankle in a neutral position it would be identified as a ankle foot orthosis and this ankle foot orthosis also known by the name of ankle foot splint the indication for which this condition is used is a foot drop and all of you know that foot drop now everything that follows you are already aware of like foot drop is because of common peroneal nerve palsy because of tibialis anterior weakness there will be a foot drop the patient won't be able to walk properly the patient would be having a high stepping gait so in order to avoid it we are having this ankle foot orthosis so the name of the splint as well as the indication next next splint on your screen is the knuckle bender splint this is knuckle bender splint also known by the name of also known by the name of bunnell splint right knuckle bender or the bunnell splint now what is the indication for using this knuckle bender or the bunnell splint the indication is majority of the times the ulnar nerve injury you know what happens in case of ulnar nerve injury there will be a claw hand so in order to prevent this claw hand from getting permanent it has to be immobilized by bending the knuckles into the position of the lumbrical function because the lumbrical function is lost all right so holding the fingers holding the hand in the position of the lumbrical function in order to prevent this claw hand deformity from getting permanent you are using this knuckle bender splint so how will you identify a knuckle bender splint simple the layman term for the metacarpophalangeal joint is knuckle so you are bending the knuckles and you are immobilizing it so any splint which is bending the knuckle and immobilizing it would be called as knuckle bender or bender uh, or or bunnell splint and the indication or the purpose for its use is the ulnar nerve injury hopefully you would be able to identify this splint next very simple many of the times they have asked this question like the name of this splint is simple that is cock up splint so many times they have asked this question already cock up splint and how will you identify a cock up splint that wrist is kept in extension the wrist would be held in extension this is how you will identify so any support any splint which is holding the wrist in extension would be identified as a cock up splint and what is the indication the indication of this cock up splint to be used is the radial nerve injury the indication obviously is the radial nerve injury radial nerve injury all of you know that radial nerve what happens there will be a wrist drop that means inability to extend the wrist and once the patient is not able to extend the wrist it has to be immobilized in a extension all right so this is how you will identify this cock up splint all right so quickly we are going to have a discussion on what are the splints that we have already seen like this is a is any splint any brace which is holding a newborn with the thighs or the hips extended or sorry abducted it would be a splint for the developmental dysplasia of hip and the splint on your screen is the pelvic harness now there are other splints which are used for ddh also it's not like that only pelvic harness is used for the purpose there are other splints which can also be used like von rosen splint can be used like uh, uh, <coughs> frechka splint can be used triple diapers can be used but all of them are obsolete today today we are using pelvic harness only in order to prevent the complications now as far as the braces for scoliosis are concerned 
one is without immobilization of the cervical spine other one is immobilization of the cervical spine if there is no immobilization it is probably a tls brace that is boston brace if there is a immobilization of the cervical spine that is a milwaukee brace which is also known as ctls brace so both of them are for preventing the deformity of the scoliosis from getting uh, from progressive it, it is it is just to limit the progression of the scoliotic deformity next is the splints for the ctev one is dennis brown splint other one is sfab so in future there is a possibility that the examiner can ask about sfabs and you already came to know about the differences in between the two and if there is a any orthosis which is um, immobilizing the ankle in neutral position it is identified as ankle foot orthosis if there is a knuckle bender splint which is bending the metacarpophalangeal joints for ulnar nerve injury and cock up splint is obviously used for the purpose of radial nerve injury so hopefully everything is clear related to this now one thing which is very important as far as these braces or splints are concerned that they are not used to correct the deformity no they are just used to prevent this deformity from getting permanent all right now next is <coughs> identify the cast you know identification of the cast now cast is something where there is a circumferential enclosure of a part of the limb in the plaster of paris simple that is cast now cast how to identify this cast that first of all it is enclosing the ankle extending all the way up to the metatarsophalangeal joints and there is a enclosure just below the level of the knee joint but you know the patellar bone is enclosed inside the cast so the name of the cast is patellar tendon bearing cast patellar tendon bearing cast you know how to ident means all the casts which are importantly identified in orthopedic practice we are going to have a discussion on but how will you identify a patellar tendon bearing cast just try to understand this Ima this is the patellar bone and here the cast is applied just which is enclosing um, you know the tibial condyles the, the cast is supporting the tibial condyles or you can say the tibial condyles are supported by the cast and then it is a below knee cast all right so basically it is also enclosing the entire patella majority of the time it is applied for the uh, where the entire patella is enclosed inside the cast all right so that is ptb or patellar tendon bearing cast now ptb is responsible for means the indication for applying this patellar tendon bearing cast is the tibial diaphyseal fractures the tibial diaphyseal fractures all right while the cylindrical cast this one is used for this one is the cylindrical cast now how will you identify a cylindrical cast that the entire thigh is enclosed inside the cast the knee is enclosed inside the cast the leg is also in, um, enclosed inside the cast but the ankle is rendered free there is no involvement in the ankle and it is kept in extension the entire immobilize the entire lower limb is immobilized in extension and the indication for this cylindrical cast is the patella fractures when the patella fractures are treated by conservative means it is treated under cylindrical cast all right so the answer for this question is patella tendon bearing cast and hopefully you have identified how the patella tendon bearing and the cylindrical cast looks like next is the glass holding cast now this is something which you already are aware of glass holding cast means how will you identify a glass holding cast that the wrist is immobilized in dorsiflexion and the thumb is immobilized in abduction so this is the position of a glass holding cast now what is the indication for this glass holding cast the indication is scaphoid fracture right scaphoid fractures are the indication for this glass holding cast on the other hand the other one is the colis cast and how will you identify a colis cast where the wrist is immobilized in palmar flexion ulnar deviation and pronation so this is how the cast is applied so that is the reason why this colis cast is also known by the name of hand shaking cast and you already are aware of that how this hand shaking cast is different from glass holding cast that in glass holding cast the wrist is immobilized in dorsiflexion while in hand shaking cast the cast is immobilized in palmar flexion in glass holding cast the thumb is immobilized in abduction while in colis cast the wrist is immobilized in ulnar deviation and pronation so this is how it is identified the colis cast you know colis related question or the colis fracture related questions they are very commonly asked uh, and this is how you will be able to identify the cast so you will be able to uh, identify a glass holding cast the colis cast the cylindrical cast and the patellar tendon bearing cast next question is 
a patient came with a discharging sinus you know whenever in any orthopedic related question there is a history of a discharging sinus with some amount of bone coming out of that sinus answer for that question straight away is chronic osteomyelitis all right so here what is being mentioned over here a patient came with the discharging sinus with the bony spicules with similar history a month back bony spicule is coming out of it what is the most common or most probable diagnosis for this particular condition answer for that question is chronic osteomyelitis so straight away you know this is the kind of the question which they have been asking again and again like all of us are aware of the reasons also like if this is a segment of the bone which is which is a sclerotic bone which is a dead piece of a bone which is surrounded by the organism if it goes avascular and there is a collection of the organism which results in the formation of the abscess this abscess might break the involucral wall to create a sinus all the way up to the level of the skin and when this abscess comes out of this involucral cavity so it might also drain out some amount of the sequestrum or it might take some amount of the sequestrum out so whenever you see this kind of a question where there is a sinus present and some amount of the bony spicule is coming out of it answer for that question is straight away is the chronic osteomyelitis all right so uh, nothing much to have a discussion on as far as these questions are concerned all right multiple times this question has been asked chronic osteomyelitis question so as you can say from infections tuberculosis and chronic osteomyelitis they used to focus on these kind of the topics in particular next is a 45 year old female what is the diagnosis now this is the kind of the question which is going to be there in this coming examination also all right that they will give you a x ray where there is a epiphyseal tumor when you have to, once you have identified that the tumor is epiphyseal that means extending all the way up to the level of the joint then you have to look at the growth plate so if the growth plate is already obliterated or the growth plate is already fused you cannot identify a growth plate in any of the adjacent that means non tumorous bone like if you look at this distal end of the ulna there is no identifiable growth plate all right if you look at the distal end of the femur in that other condition there is no identifiable growth plate that means growth plates are already fused so epiphyseal tumor growth plates are fused then answer for that question straight away is giant cell tumor all right gct because gct is the tumor of elderly that means oh, sorry gct is the tumor of a skeletal immature that means more than 20 years of age and answer for this question is osteoclastoma because gct is also called by the name of osteoclastoma right epiphyseal tumor no growth plate visible on the x rays answer for that question is gct but if there is a epiphyseal tumor right if there is a epiphyseal tumor but the growth plates are still visible then answer for that question would be chondroblastoma it would be identified as a chondroblastomatous tumor chondroblastoma all right now whenever you see a kind of a expanding a malignant kind of a tumor which is having a central core which is more dense look at the central core which is more dense compared to the peripheral radiations it gives it the appearance of a sunburst appearance it goes in the favor of osteosarcoma so this is how you are going to identify the osteosarcomatous x rays which are provided to you all right osteosarcoma related questions osteosarcoma related x rays are very easily identified because the central core would be more necrotic because it is more necrotic it would be more calcified and the tumor grows towards the periphery that means there will be a new vascularization which will be assisting the peripheral growth of the tumor so it would be radiolytic in comparison to the central core of the tumor as a result of which it gives a appearance that is known by the name of sunburst appearance or a rising sun appearance all right so osteosarcoma can be easily identified on that basis on the other hand if you look at another epiphyseal tumor as i told you epiphyseal tumor growth plate is fused gct epiphyseal tumor growth plate is still visible answer for that question is chondroblastoma now here as a spot diagnostic question it is not very difficult to identify this is a tumor which is outpouching from the metaphyses of the bone all right it is a outgrowth from the metaphyseal region in case of a skeletally immature patient majority of the time so answer for that question is osteochondroma all right this is the kind of the question which they have been asking multiple of the times they have asked this question also known by the name of exostosis so many things which are important related to this particular topic as far as this MC fmg examination is concerned what they are more asking what they are more keen on asking again and again is identification of this particular tumor on the x ray it is very easily identified just they will you have to just look at the x ray there will be outpouching kind of a tumor which could be connected 
to the parent bone through a stalk that is pedunculated kind of a tumor known by the name of osteochondroma or exostosis. On the other hand, if you look at this a tiny uh, hole in the osteoid matrix or you can say in the cortex of the long bone, a tiny hole in the cortex of the long bone or radiolytic lesion in the cortex of the long bone, then answer for that question is straight away is osteoid osteoma. Alright, so basically it is a radiolucent nidus within the long bone cortex, then answer for that question is osteoid osteoma. Alright, if this is a cortex of the long bone, alright, and here in the center we are having a radiolytic or radiolucent nidus which can be very easily identified in this particular case so answer for that question would be osteoid osteoma lesion okay now this is something which they have been asking very recently again and again that a shepherd krug deformity all right the femur is likely to be affected by that shepherd krug deformity shepherd krug deformity as well as ground glass appearance ground glass appearance so whenever you see this kind of a femur where the medial cortex is more curved in comparison to the lateral one as a result of which the there is a reversal of the angulation of the neck shaft femur femoral angle so this give it a appearance of a shepherd crook known by the name of a shepherd crook deformity and ground glass appearance means a radiolytic lesions at, uh, in the metaphyseal diaphyseal region of the long bone, all of them are the features of fibrous dysplasia. So, this goes in the favor of fibrous dysplasia. Now, it is worth mentioning that what you have to remember related to this particular topic, fibrous dysplasia, is, is the syndrome, right? The name of the syndrome is McCune and Bright syndrome. So, don't uh, do remember this syndrome or do revise this syndrome before sitting in the examination that McCune Elbright syndrome consisting of polyostrotic fibrous dysplasia, cafe ule spot and the precocious puberty, right? So identification of the tumors like this. So on that basis we are having the questions like 11 year old boy sustained injury while playing football having intermittent fever, x-rays are as follows although there is no history means if you look at the uh, options they are asking about a tumor history of injury which is an insignificant one will always be provided to you even if the patient is presenting with the tumor 11 year is the age provided and as you can very clearly observe that there are there are the periosteal reactions which are encroaching the long bone diaphyseal region in the femur so answer for that question is straight away goes in the favor of Ewing sarcoma because onion peel appearance onion peel appearance goes in the favor of Ewing sarcomatous tumors so as far as this FMG examination is concerned what they are asking a, about the or related to the tumor is that they will give you an x-ray they will give you a slight hint in the question and then they will ask you on the basis of the x-rays itself that what is the most likely tumor the patient is particularly suffering from all right now one question out of this particular topic will always always be asked all right one to two questions can be asked like what is the name of the bone and adjacent to that bone or related to that bone what is the name of the nerve that is likely to get injured all right now as far as this shoulder dislocation is concerned you already know that the name of the nerve wherever the shoulder is injured the name of the nerve that is likely to get injured in association with this is the axillary nerve similarly if there is a fracture in the proximal aspect of the humerus axillary nerve is likely to get injured if there is a fracture in the shaft of the humerus in the mid one third region in particular then the radial nerve is likely to get injured for supracondylar fracture of the humerus is the anterior interosseous branch of the median nerve because anterior interosseous nerve is actually a branch of the median nerve so they have asked this question multiple hundreds of the times that supracondylar fracture even today we are having the students which are getting confused like ulnar nerve is the name of the nerve which is likely to get injured because of supracondylar fractures no it is anterior interosseous branch of the median nerve as far as elbow dislocation is concerned yes ulnar nerve is likely the nerve to get injured because of the posterior lateral subluxation or dislocation of the elbow montagia fracture dislocation is associated with the posterior interosseous nerve injury and posterior interosseous nerve is a branch of the radial nerve right wokeman ischemic contracture again the anterior interosseous branch of the median nerve is likely to get injured 
As far as dislocation of the hip joint is concerned, you already know that posterior dislocation of the hip joint is far more common in comparison to the anterior one and posterior to the hip joint is the sciatic nerve. So sciatic is the name of the nerve that is likely to get injured along with it. Wrist dislocation again the major, <coughs> sorry, the major nerve which is passing right anterior to the wrist is the median nerve. So median nerve is likely the nerve to get injured or compressed. And in case of a knee dislocation, the name of the nerve which is likely to get injured is the common peroneal nerve. All right. So any fracture around the knee joint, particularly on the lateral aspect or the penetrating injury to the knee on the lateral aspect will result in a common peroneal nerve injury. So what they are particularly asking out of this particular topic is that they will give you an x-ray. Then they can directly ask about the name of the nerve which is likely to get injured or they can ask about the clinical findings related to that nerve injury. So there are three things that you have to remember, particularly uh, in, which are directly or indirectly related to that particular topic. Like in case of axillary nerve injury, there will be limitation of the abduction of the shoulder. In case of radial nerve injury, there will be wrist drop. There will be inability to extend the wrist, inability to extend the metacarpophalangeal joint. In case of supracondylar fracture of the humerus, the patient would be having an anterior interosseous branch of the median nerve injury. In case of Montegia fracture dislocation, the patient won't be able to extend the metacarpophalangeal joint because of posterior interosseous nerve injury, right? In case of uh, dislocation of the hip where there is a sciatic nerve injury, there will be foot drop. In case of dislocation of the hip where there is a common peroneal nerve injury, there will be a foot drop. So associated with these fractures, associated with these nerve injury, what are the clinical findings? These are also important for you to remember. So at least two questions out of, out of this particular table is expected every time. So many times we have discussed this, uh, uh, this question, the next one is that the doctor prescribed him the following splint after operating upon the shaft humerus fracture because shaft humerus fracture might have resulted in any sort of an injury to the radial nerve. It could be neuropraxic, it could be neurotmetic, it could be exonotmetic injury to the radial nerve. But once the radial nerve is injured, the cock up splint is applied in order to prevent this uh, deformity into flexion. Right? What is the name of the disease? You know, syndactyly, where more than two, two or more than two of the toes or hands are fused. All right. So it is syndactyly. Polydactyly, already you, you know, poly means more than five toes or fingers in a single hand or a foot. That is polydactyly. Macro means larger in proportion or larger size in proportion or in comparison. Micro means smaller the size in comparison or proportions. All right. That is microdactyly. So this is the kind of the question which they have already asked and you already know the answer for this particular question. All right. Next is identify the condition. You know, spine related two topics are very, very importantly kept in your examination. One is related to the ankylosing spondylitis. And you know, we are having a tendency as, a, as an FMG graduate, we have a tendency that whenever we see the x-ray of a spine being provided to you in the, in the examination, then we try to imagine that the answer of that particular question would be ankylosing spondylitis. But actually, it could be anything else also. So what is happening over here, just try to understand that all these vertebrae are aligned to each other except at this level that is L4 and L5. You see L4 and L5 here what is visible on the lateral view is the displacement, displacement happening that the L5 is posteriorly displaced in comparison to L4 and this displacement is happening at the vertebral bodies is known by the name of spondylolisthesis. It is actually the listhetic abnormality happening and in, in the axial skeleton and spondylo is the word which is representing the axial skeleton. So the condition the patient is suffering from is a spondylolisthesis. Alright, simple. It's a very simple question. Like don't jump onto the answer and mark the ankylosing spondylitis before thinking that when you see this lateral displacement happening, answer for that question is spondylolisthesis. Alright, as far as prolapsed intervertebral disc is concerned, if they are asking any question related to PIVD, there has to be an acute phenomena. All right, they will give you a history of an acute phenomena like lifting heavy objects. And after that, the patient fell down suddenly. So these are the kind of the history which are always going to be provided. Spondylitis is actually an inflammatory disorder of the vertebral body or you can say the say, axial skeleton. So it is not the inflammatory or it could be a preceding event 
that because of this inflammation, this displacement is happening. But now when it is displaced, it is a spondylolisthesis. As far as rheumatic, uh, rheumat uh, rheumatic arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis is concerned, the clinical picture is entirely different. All right, for this rheumatoid arthritis scenarios. So hopefully you are able to identify the condition. Hopefully you will be able to mark the condition or mark the answer for this particular question. Because whenever you see this kind of a question, then don't jump onto the conclusion and mark the answer as ankylosing spondylitis. Okay. All right. The next one: a person met with an accident while sitting. In the front seat of the car. Now, here they have mentioned the mechanism of injury, the front seat of the car. Now, this front seat of the car mechanism is actually a dashboard injury. You know what happens in dashboard injury? Like if a person is riding in the front seat of the car, there are sudden application of the brakes, the knee will strike against the dashboard. So the force which he is transmitting to the dashboard, the knee will be subjected to the equal and opposite force from the dashboard to the knee joint. All right, And this force will be transmitting all the way up to the level of the hip, thereby thrusting it to move posteriorly. So that is dashboard mechanism is provided. Now, following which he was presented in the emergency with the right thigh in flexion, adduction and internal rotation. And you know that flexion, adduction and internal rotation, if the thigh is kept in flexion, adduction and internal rotation, it is the attitude for posterior dislocation of the hip joint. So in the question, not only the attitude is provided, but the mechanism of injury is also provided. Now, x-rays are as follows. Now, here what you can very clearly observe, although based on this relation of the head of the femur and acetabulum, you cannot say whether it is anterior or posterior to the acetabulum. But if you look at the thigh, it is clearly in adduction. And flexion, adduction, internal rotation is the abnormality, is the deformity, is the attitude with which the patient presents in posterior dislocation of the hip joint. So answer for this question is posterior dislocation of the hip straight away. Like in case of anterior dislocation of the hip, what would be the attitude provided? It would be abduction and external rotation. Now it could be in flexion or not, it could be in extension or not, but abduction and external rotation are always there. So if you see it in comparison with the posterior dislocation of the hip joint, in posterior dislocation it is flexion, adduction, internal rotation, while in case of anterior dislocation it is abduction and external rotation deformity which is happening. All right. So this was the question which was asked. Uh, one question out of this topic in particular they used to give. All right. And you are already are aware, means you are aware or you must be aware of what is the possible answer for this particular question. Next is, a patient came with the supraspinatus tendinitis. Now, you know what happens, supraspinatus is the name of the muscle, the tendon of which is a component of a rotator cuff. You know, rotator cuff is a common tendinous insertion of four muscles, that is supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor and subscapularis. And supraspinatus is responsible for initiation of abduction. So when you try to abduct or initiate the abduction of the shoulder, the supraspinatus will contract and the condition will become more painful. So initiation of abduction of the shoulder would be more painful in supraspinatus tendinitis. All right. So supraspinatus tendinitis, the more uh, which range of the shoulder is uh, particularly painful is up to 30 degree because of the direct utilization of the supraspinatus muscle in order to perform this movement. All right. Initiation of the shoulder abduction. All right. Now, uh, you know, related to the shoulder, something which we are expecting, although uh, um, if if you know, in any orthopedic related question, if they give you a history of diabetes mellitus and some shoulder arthropathy they are asking, then answer for that question is, okay, you can write it down also. Like this is for uh, other set of the question which we are expecting, like orthopedic question. First of all, you have to identify that the question is from orthopedics. They are giving some shoulder abnormality. They are mentioning some shoulder abnormality. That means the patient is not able to abduct, the patient is not able to internally rotate the arm and there is a history of diabetes mellitus also provided to you in the question, then answer for that question is frozen shoulder. All right, answer for that question is frozen shoulder. So this is something which we are expecting or the answer for that question is periarthritis of the shoulder. It is a very common phenomenon nowadays which is happening because of the increasing prevalence of the diabetes mellitus. All right. And when the diabetes mellitus goes out of control or if it is not controlled for a long duration of time, then it is having these kind of the abnormalities where the patient is not able to abduct and internally rotate the shoulder right, or the arm. 
Next question is the patient is having hip pain with true shortening of the limb. Now this is something which we have already talked about. You know when we were talking about the tuberculosis of the hip joint, this is the kind of the question which we were expecting and they have asked this question last year itself in FMG examination. Like the patient is having a hip pain with true shortening of the limb. Now true shortening of the limb is representing the advanced arthritis of the hip joint in tuberculosis of the hip and stability is maintained. Maintained stability means there is no subluxation, there is no dislocation. They, all right. So it is diagnosed as TB hip. The condition was diagnosed as tuberculosis of the hip. Now, what is the stage? Answer for that question is advanced arthritis. We already are aware of this particular question. We have talked about this in tuberculosis of the hip joint. All right. Next uh, question is very simple. Like sunlight is responsible for causing conversion reaction of the formation of which of the following? You already know like 7-D hydrocholesterol, you know the 7-D hydrocholesterol is the most precursor form of the vitamin D that has to be converted into cholecalciferol and this conversion is brought about by UVB radiations. So here the role of sunlight comes in and this cholecalciferol has to be converted into 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol which is also known by the name of vitamin D2 so this conversion is because of 25 hydroxylase enzyme that happens in case of uh, liver this conversion happens in liver and then finally what happens is this 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol is converted into 125 dihydroxy cholecalciferol also known as vitamin D3 also known as calcitriol and this calcitriol formation happens in case of renal parenchyma under the influence of the enzyme that is alpha 1 hydroxylase all right so this is the flow chart that you already are aware of right from the biochemistry even from the physiology lectures like what is the vitamin d metabolism right from its most precursor form that is 7 dehydrocholesterol so what they are asking over here is that the sunlight is responsible for conversion reaction of the formation of which of the following answer for this question is cholecalciferol that is a precursor form of vitamin d now most common joint which is likely to be affected in septic arthritis you know septic arthritis means the pyogenic infections of the joint remember septic arthritis simply means the pyogenic infection of the joint and the most common joint to be affected over here is the knee joint knee is the most common site to be affected hip is the second most common site to be affected by septic arthritis all right knee is the first most common site knee, hip joint is the second most common site and the condition is likely to happen in case of uh, children and you know whenever the question is continued like in the form like what next what is the next investigation that you will go for then answer for that question is usg but if the question is asked in the form of like what is the investigation of choice next in that case the answer for that question would be mri you know if the patient is having a pyogenic infection of the joint more likely that the patient is a child five years six years seven years of age three years two years of the age also now in that case even a ultrasonography can detect the abnormality in the form of the pus or the abscess present inside or outside the capsule joint capsule that means intraarticular or extraarticular within the bone or outside the bone that can be depicted on the usg itself so usg or ultrasonography is considered to be a, a linear investigation in comparison to the mri so MRI no doubt is the investigation of the choice but if the question is asked in the form like what next investigation that you have to go for then in that case ultrasonography is the investigation of choice is in that case ultrasonography is the investigation that you have to proceed with right septic arthritis uh, nerve injury causing foot drop this is something which we have already talked about or discussed answer for that question is common peroneal nerve now there is some confusion in between the deep and the common peroneal nerve because you will say that you know tibialis anterior is the major muscle which is likely to be affected over here and tibialis anterior is the major dorsiflexor of the ankle the major dorsiflexor of the ankle is getting paralyzed and because of that the foot drop is happening point number one clear now this tibialis anterior is receiving its innervation by the deep peroneal nerve right deep peroneal nerve is responsible for innervating the tibialis anterior but you know there are some variabilities also 
where common peroneal nerve is directly innervating the tibialis anterior and deep peroneal nerve is actually a branch of the common peroneal nerve. So, if we talk about the variables also, if we talk about the exceptions also, in any case, the nerve to tibialis anterior is coming from the common peroneal nerve, either in the form of a deep peroneal nerve or directly from the common peroneal nerve. So, if this is the kind of the option provided to you where both deep peroneal as well as common peroneal are present in the option, then you have to choose the answer as common peroneal nerve because the possibility of uh, tibialis anterior nerve or the nerve to the tibialis anterior origin from the common peroneal nerve is also there. All right. So, in any case, common peroneal nerve is directly or indirectly affiliated to or related to this foot drop. So, nerve injury which is causing foot drop answer for that question is common peroneal nerve. Next, which part of the scaphoid is most vulnerable to osteonecrosis? Now, scaphoid related, you know, the cast is one thing which they used to ask. We have already talked about the scaphoid cast or the glass holding cast. The second thing related to the scaphoid they used to ask is the complication. Point is that if, example, this is the scaphoid bone. This is the distal part of the scaphoid and this is the proximal part of the scaphoid and this is the vascular status of the scaphoid. The vascular status of the scaphoid is such that the proximal pole of the scaphoid, this part of the scaphoid is dependent on distal vascularity. There is no or insufficient vascularity which is independently supplying the proximal pole of the scaphoid. As a result of which what will happen that this bone if it is fractured from here, then it will result in a cut to the vascular supply to the proximal pole as a result of which the proximal pole will become avascular. So, if you compare the three fracture lines, like this is fracture line 1, 2 and 3, the fracture line 1 which is most distant from the most vascular part will be having the worst prognostic outcome. So, what you have to remember in the fractures of the scaphoid is that proximal the fracture proximal the fracture, poorer the prognosis and what are the prognostic complications which are associated with this fracture of the scaphoid are one is non-union and the other one is osteonecrosis that means avascular necrosis. So, obviously this both non-union as well as osteonecrosis are more likely to happen if the fracture is in the proximal part. So, which part of the scaphoid is most vulnerable to osteonecrosis? Obviously, the answer for that question is proximal one-third. Hopefully, you get the idea. You know, scaphoid related, these are your two questions. One is uh, uh, management, that is cast which is used. They used to ask it by giving you the images also. And the second one is that what are the possible complications related to the scaphoid fracture. One more thing which you have to remember, which, which, uh, which is provided to, to you in the form of a question as a hint. It is in the form of a hint which is provided to you in the question is that the patient is having a tenderness, that the patient is having a tenderness in a snuff box. Right? After getting injury, there is a snuff box tenderness. Then possibly the examiner is asking or he has provided you a hint which is enough for you to identify or relate it, the question with the scaphoid fractures. Now, this is something which we have already talked about in the discussion of the tumors. Like this is the tumor which is outpouching from the metaphyseal region of the bone where the medullary canal is in direct continuity with that of a parent bone. Then answer for that question is osteochondroma, also known by the name of exostosis. All right. Next is 33 year old pain in the right knee. The patient came with the pain in the right knee, massive swelling, patellar tap is positive. Patellar tap means positivity means that when you try to press the patella and then release it, then the patellar, there will be a rebound um, uh, expansion because of the fluid which is present inside and the patella will hit your thumb again. All right. So that is patellar tap positivity. Arthrocentesis done, that means you aspirated the joint. Synovial aspirate revealed the needle shaped crystals and negative birefringence when it is subjected to plain polarized microscopy. What is the diagnosis the patient is suffering from? Now, just try to understand what we are dealing over here is the difference in between gout and pseudo gout. Now, as far as this, um, uh, this uh, FMG examination is concerned, they used to ask this question like gout and pseudo gout. Gout, you already know that it is a purine metabolic. It is a purine metabolic disorder. Purine metabolic disorder, while pseudogout is a degenerative joint disease. 
it is a degenerative joint disease all right gout is a purine metabolic disorder while pseudo gout is not a pyrimidine metabolic disorder it is a degenerative joint disease now gout the crystals of the gout are having some specificities like they are needle shaped and they are <coughs> having negative birefringence when it is subject subjected to plane polarized microscopy while the crystals of the pseudo gout they are rhomboid and they show weakly positive birefringence when it is subjected subjected to plane polarized microscopy next what is the name of the crystal of the gout it is monosodium urate the name of the crystal is monosodium monosodium urate monohydrate crystal all right while the crystal of the pseudo gout is cppd that is calcium pyrophosphate dihydrate crystal all right and finally there is a propensity there is a tendency of a smaller joint involvement by gout so gout are usually involving the smaller joint like first metatarsophalangeal is the most common joint to be affected by that but pseudo gout is particularly having a tendency to affect the larger joint and the knee is the most common joint to be affected so these are the important differences in between the two now if you look at this question the knee is likely to be the knee is affected but when you went for the synovial aspiration you have found that the revealed it needle shaped crystals and negative birefringence to plane polarized microscopy so this goes in the favor of gout you know knee joint involvement does not mean that the patient cannot have gout in that so there is a tendency of involvement of a smaller joint but large joint uh, exception is not there so it goes in the favor of gout you know what is the full form of s o n n k it is spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee joint that is medial compartment get osteonecrotic over a period of time that is also a degenerative kind of the arthropathy all right so this is the difference how you will identify a question related to gout and pseudo gout next is okay 78 year old female you know whenever in any orthopedic related question if they are providing you the age which is elderly age group is elderly age group and injury to the wrist then answer for, to that question straight away is colis fracture all right <coughs> even if the question is non specifically asked even if there is no specific finding which is provided to you in the question then also you have to go with the answer of a colis fracture now what all you have to remember in the colis fracture two of the points which are already mentioned in the question one is the age injury to the wrist dinner fork deformity so these are the kind of the conditions because of the dorsal displacement you know because of the dorsal displacement of the distal part of the radius there will be a dinner fork abnormality or dinner fork deformity as far as management of this condition is concerned we have already talked about close reduction and colis cast application is the management for this so colis related questions are very important means colis cast colis fracture they will they can give you the x rays also they will ask about the management also every time the age group will be provided to you in the form of elderly female because this happens in case of elderly female and you will not go with the surgical intervention you have to manage it means non surgically or conservatively dinner fork deformity is important dorsal displacement is the part of the definition that is extra articular fracture distal radius fracture at cortico cancellous junction with dorsal displacement and some of the complications are also important for you to remember like there will be a um, um, rigidity of the wrist there will be uh, malunion which is um, uh, which might be responsible for this abnormalities of the movement all right malunion is a very common complication that tend to happen in, in these cases and other complications like complex regional painful syndromes compartment this uh, carpal tunnel syndrome so all these things can happen related to colis fracture so colis related question one question they are asking colis related question every time in your examination simple identification of the deformity you know in the medio lateral plane medio lateral plane if there is a joint abnormality or joint angular abnormality it could be a varus or a valgus abnormality right in the coronal plane if there is a joint abnormality it could be a varus or valgus abnormality so here you can very clearly see that the axis of the joint having an apex which is pointing away from the midline all right this apex is pointing away from the midline it is known as varus all right 
in case if the joint is pointing towards the midline of the body then it would have been represented as valgus so varus or valgus abnormalities that is so answer for this question is genu varum genu is the word which is representing the knee joint varus is the varus deformity simple valgus is exactly opposite when both the knees are pointing towards each other it would be genu valgus deformity point number 3 is genu recurvatum now what do you mean by this genu recurvatum you know in the sagittal section if the knee is hyper extended in comparison to the normal then it is genu recurvatum so what is recurvatum it is hyper extension of the knee joint hyper extension of the knee joint while genu flexion simple is the flexion deformity of the knee joint all right now 6 year old injury to the elbow because you know supra condylar fracture of the humerus are very very commonly asked topic radial artery feeble hand movement are present x rays are as follows what is the name of the vessel which is at danger you know identification of the fracture is important like this is the distal end of the humerus if there is a fracture in this region it would be called a supra condylar fracture of the humerus so the topic we are talking about is the supra condylar fracture of the humerus and every time you see this topic supra condylar fracture something which you have to remember is the complications or are the complications now complications can be categorized into immediate complication immediate means immediately after the fracture there are complications that are likely to happen and in that case it could be a brachial arterial injury or a anterior interosseous nerve injury you know the name of the artery which is lying right in front of this supracondylar region is the brachial artery and there is always a possibility of impingement of this artery by this supracondylar fracture displacement all right so brachial artery can be injured the name of the nerve which is most commonly likely to be affected is the anterior interosseous branch of the median nerve which we have already talked about so these are the Im immediate complication other one are the early complications early complications results in compartment syndrome so over a period of time what will happen there will be accumulation of too much of the blood in this region thereby causing blebs thereby causing excessive swelling thereby reducing the blood flow thereby leading to ischemic necrosis of the muscles around so it might result in compartment syndrome and finally the late complications the late complications involves the malunion and this malunion will result in cubitus varus deformity all right majority of the times the supracondylar fracture are responsible for getting the cubitus varus deformity where there will be a apex pointing away from the midline of the body and this cubitus varus deformity is also known by the name of gunstock deformity all right cubitus varus or the gunstock deformity and another complication that can happen as a late complication is the myositis ossificans myositis myo that means inflammatory pathology of the muscles leading to its ossification so myositis ossificans that means muscles are getting ossified so if you have to remember anything related to this particular topic that is supracondylar fracture of the humerus are the complications my means anything that you have to remember are the complications of these fractures all right next is 20 year old with pain over hand what is the diagnosis you know whenever there is a x ray of the hand provided to you in the question and they are asking about a tumor then answer for this question is enchondroma all right they are asking about a bone tumor then if they are giving you the x ray of the hand then answer for that question is enchondroma and remember enchondroma is also important because of two reasons one is olier disease so you should be knowing about what is olier disease and the other one is mafucci syndrome so you should be knowing about what is mafucci syndrome what is olier disease it is multiple enchondromatosis having the tendency to get <coughs> 20% transformation of into malignant tumor that means malignant transformation possibility is as high as 20% mafucci syndrome is the multiple enchondromatosis along with the cutaneous hemangioma with the possibility of malignant transformation as high as 40% so these are the things that you have to remember related to this particular topic now 70 year old bilateral genu varus deformity difficult to squat and sit cross legged what is a most probable diagnosis so you simply are aware of the fact that in primary osteoarthritis of the knee joint majority of the time they go into varus because of the medial compartmentalization so they go into varus and if at all the option has to be gout suppose gout has to be the answer for this particular question then they should have mentioned the swelling they should have mentioned the crystal specification they should have mentioned the age 
in particular the younger one all right so gout is obviously not the answer for this question had it been a rheumatoid arthritis they should have mentioned anything which is related to the activity that means the symptoms it decreases in relation to the activity there has to be a asymmetrical joint involvement there has to be a uh, earlier age group that means less age group so obviously this is not the answer for this particular question the, everything goes in the favor of osteoarthritis because 70 year old that means towards elderly bilateral affection bilateral involvement both of them are having a similar kind of a deformity that is varus deformity at the knee joint and that much is provided so primary diagnosis the provisional diagnosis obviously is going to be or most likely diagnosis obviously is going to be that of osteoarthritis pseudogout obviously not all right because in order to get the answer of pseudogout then again some, some something specifically mentioned should have been mentioned related to the crystals the swelling the joint aspirations all right so hopefully this point is also clear uh, tomorrow you are having a major mock test uh, which is going to start at 9 a.m and uh, we'll come, with, come up with the solutions uh, 5 p.m. onwards. So all the best for your examination, all the best for your future. <coughs> Hopefully the session was relatively helpful for you to identify the most commonly asked questions in orthopedics. Thank you very much. All the best.